Hello, my name is Neil Ferguson. I'm the Millbank Family Senior Fellow here at the Hoover Institution and Chair of the Hoover History Working Group. Uh, and just the other day, we had the great good fortune to have Philip Zellico uh, present to us uh, an extraordinary and important uh, new book uh, about which I'm uh, going to ask him some questions now. Before I do that, I should explain uh, a little bit about Philip's unusual career. Uh, some people spend their lives in academia, some uh, confine themselves to the corridors of power, but Philip Zellico uh, knows both worlds. And I think that gives his work uh, a really uh, distinctive quality that's often missing from more purely academic scholars. He was uh, the executive director of the 9-11 Commission uh, he is currently the director of the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia, uh, where he's the White Bucket Miller Professor of History. Uh, but back in the day, uh, Philip, who studied history, then law, was a career foreign service officer uh, who served under Secretary of State uh, George Schultz, our late lamented colleague here at Hoover in the 1980s. Uh, during the administration of George H.W. Bush, Philip was on the National Security Council, where he played a key role in the events that culminated in German reunification. He also had a ringside seat uh, on the NSC for the first Gulf War. He spent much of the 1990s at Harvard, uh, at the Kennedy School, before going to UVA. The book that Phillips just published, uh, The Road Less Traveled, The Secret Battle to End the Great War, 1916 to 1917, takes us back uh, a century or so to an absolutely pivotal moment in US foreign policy, the moment when President Woodrow Wilson appeared to be in a position to broker an end to World War I. Philip, it's a Great pleasure to have you with us here. And Glad I wondered, as, as you were working on this book, how far your own experience in government shaped your understanding of the opportunity, missed opportunity as it turned, that presented itself to President Wilson in 1916? Well, actually, the uh, experience in government was vital uh, because it allowed you to see things through the eyes of other people in power and other people who are working diplomatic strategies. And so you could, um, instead of just looking backward with hindsight and observe, well, they made this choice and they made that one. And then saying, oh, why did they make that choice? Instead, what you do is reconstruct the choices because you can see, oh, what could they have done instead? What other things were on the table? If they had wanted to do this or that thing, here's the way that could have been done. Oh, gee, now that I see that, I see that actually people are doing things to set those uh, possibilities up. In other words, you, here I am in this moment in history. You're at a turning point in the First World War. War stalemated. None of the sides think they have any good military options to bring it to a close. Uh, very secretly, uh, they're looking for ways out. Very secretly, Woodrow Wilson is planning to do it and trying to figure out a way to mediate an end of the war. And then the enormous tragic turning point is how he not only fails to end the war, which then becomes a pivot point for world history, he ends up fumbling things so badly that the German high command throws up their hands U-boat war, and now he brings America into the war, which actually widens it, prolongs it. And then of course you get the Russian revolution, the Bolshevik takeover in Russia and all these cascading consequences. So, but you go back and say, well, what could they have, what were they trying to do? What did they do? Could they have done instead? I mean, for instance, if you reconstruct it from the point of view of the policymaker, you actually see all sorts of connections between things that other historians had not noticed. You see that when Wilson is trying to set the conditions to bring the war to an end, simultaneously in one week, he A, 
drafts a peace message calling for everyone to come to a peace conference on terms for a compromise. B, quite secretly arranges with the Federal Reserve Board to cut off all further unsecured loans to the Allied side which will effectively reduce them to only getting loans for which they have liquid collateral that can be physically deposited in New York, which of which they are running quite low and he knows this. C, secretly sends through his con confidant, Edward House, a message to the British government lashing them to tell them it's time to make a compromise piece now. He writes only to the British because he already holds in his hand a secret plea from the Germans to mediate an end of the war and putting compromise offers on the table for him to use. As someone coming into this as a policymaker, you can see all these three things going on in the same week. And then you can construct, ah, I see what's going on, which then of course just compounds the fascination of why didn't this work out? The stakes are amazingly high when you think back uh, to the, the year 1916. Had the war been uh, brought to a conclusion then, or at least the process of peacemaking begun, the enormous numbers of lives saved uh, boggle the mind. This would have been hundreds of thousands. Uh, millions. Could quickly get to millions because the, the cost of the the continuation of the war was extraordinarily high in terms of human life, as well as in terms, as you mentioned, of, of political disruption. One can imagine a world without the Bolshevik revolution succeeding, maybe even a world without Mussolini's fascists. It's a radically uh, attractive, counterfactual, and you and I are amongst that minority of historians that, that think it's okay to think about what if yes. questions in this way, but I get completely that the Germans would have taken this uh, negotiated peace. Uh, and I think it's also clear that it was attractive uh, to the French and Russians who in their different ways were struggling to sustain the war effort. There are two things that go wrong in your account. Uh, one of them is uh, the way in which this brilliant strategic opportunity is bungled and it's bungled by an intermediary so you need to tell us about the enigmatic figure of colonel house the person on whom wilson relied who in your telling threw away the opportunity maybe with uh with intent or maybe just through ineptitude tell us about house and the role he played I'll come to that, but I, I don't want to let pass unnoticed the important insight you restated about the German interest, because this is a picture of the Germans that actually is almost non-existent in the main literature. It's, you take it for granted because you get it, and I document it in the book, but actually, by and large, people, uh, this is one of the things that comes as a surprise to people. Yeah. There, there's generally no knowledge that the Germans made a secret peace offer in August 1916, no knowledge that they put these compromises on the table like an offer to restore Belgium and the like. So before I come to house, I just want to tag that you have that insight, but actually that's not, to, that's not commonly shared and it's worth noting and it's, it's explained in detail in the book. And that's of course, because the literature has emphasized the Germans as the villains of the peace for so many years that the, the public understanding of, of the war has remained uh, quite Germanophobic. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and actually, you know what? We don't even have to enter into a debate on 1914 and who's responsible in 1914, even the responsibility of the German chancellor, but von Hoveg in 1914, people can differ about that because we're in 1916 and in, and in 1916 it seems to me actually the posture of the germans is is quite clear and well documented and is a separate issue from the responsibility for those tumultuous complicated puzzling events of that those hurried weeks of july 1914 now back to colonel house so House is a curious figure. He's an expatriate Texan, a slight fellow with a, 
white mustache and a kind of a whispering confidential style. He is a private citizen. He's not even an employee of the government at all. And he doesn't even live in Washington. He lives in an apartment in Midtown Manhattan. He's the president's close political friend, has been since 1912, um, really since late 1911. Um, they write to each other and then House will occasionally come visit. Usually, usually these are visits full of confidences about Democratic Party politics, patronage and plans. But because Wilson perceives House as this well-traveled man who'd done these grand tours of Europe before the war, he thinks House has some special insight and is a useful bridge to the ruling circles in Europe and above all the ruling circles in London, which is where House has his best social entree. Uh, the French actually have a little use for House. The Germans are very polite to him, but uh, are kind of puzzled by him. London is his supreme entree, and it's also where he makes his supreme errors. But House um, has his entree not because of his official stature, but because of his private position. And when Wilson's life, Wilson, um, the portrait of Wilson in the book is quite complex, actually, as you know, it's, it's not a negative cartoon or a positive cartoon. It's actually a man with formidable strengths and strategic insight, coupled, however, with these curious personal weaknesses and um, rigidities and this insularity in which he's relying so much on this fellow to talk to other people for him. Even though he doesn't regard House as an intellectual equal, he regards right. him as a conduit. But House, it turns out, is a conduit with a mind of his own, who is frequently dissembling both ways, um, conveying misleading information both ways, in part because he's trying to, he's not yet convinced that the British want to come in, want, want peace and he's not yet sure that he wants to help corner the British into facing this, though House on that issue will occasionally waffle. Uh, so my editor asked me at one point, and I actually put this question in the book, is House a fool or a villain? <laughs> and I answer that saying, well, actually, I think the best evidence is that he's a bit of both. Uh, a Machiavellian villain portrait, that is, he's always trying to bring America into the war, and he's simply conspiring with supreme skill to do that. I don't think the evidence actually sustains that either. Um, it's, uh, he's, he's more wayward, drifting, uh, bobbing on the current, but always, always trying not to get too crosswise with the Brits whose opinion he values as the reflection of his own stature as a statesman and how he's received in London. And no opinion matters more to him than the opinion of David Lloyd George. Who is the other key figure in the story and nobody's fool. So if there's a, a devious uh, and Machiavellian figure, it's surely Lloyd George who knows full well the state of the war, is aware of the risks uh, that Britain faces, particularly from an economic or financial vantage point, and yet seems consciously to scupper the possibility of peace by publicly affirming that Britain can fight on, uh, at quite at odds with his private views, and I think in your account, seizing the opportunity uh, to become prime minister himself. Is it fair to say that Lloyd George squandered the chance of peace to get to the top of the greasy pole of British politics? Uh, is that the main reason in the end that this whole opportunity foundered? That was, I think that was the conclusion the book left me with. But I wonder if I'm perhaps too susceptible to the anti-Lloyd George view of British history. Actually, I think your conclusion is about right, but it's actually, his view is even more egotistical than that, as I'll ex explain in a moment. But it's worth noting that the, 
one place where the book has received the most critical attention so far is actually in Britain. Um, because, uh, and your, some of your listeners may not realize this, this is the first book that's ever been published disclosing fully the story of these peace talks that could have ended the war at the turning point. Um, there's just never really been a book that's pulled this story together before. And therefore there's never been a book that spotlighted the British role in that story in this way before. And that's beginning now to command attention. I think that if people in Britain fully digest this book, they'll need to post guards at Lloyd George's tomb in Westminster Abbey to keep it from being vandalized because of the conclusion that you mentioned. But what I meant about even more egotistical in, and this comes out in a series of astonishing confidences that Lloyd George just blurts out to uh, Maurice Hankey, who recorded them that day in his diary. Um, at this crucial time in November 1916, when the British are debating uh, quite secretly whether to bring the war to an end and seek a compromise peace, actually had a full cabinet debate that began that discussion uh, in November 1916. Um, the, by the way, the, the evidence for which has just recently surfaced. Um, in, the, in that, Lord George's attitude is, I'm going to take this public stance as Mr. Fight to the finish, while privately I'm saying that our cause in the war is hopeless. Because the posture of being Mr. Fight to the finish is going to position me publicly against the weak and declining Asquith. And then maybe I'll, and I'll be pushed. My only road to supreme power now is as the war prime minister, because I've lost my great base in the Liberal Party through the last, things that have happened in the last couple of years. Yet, once he's in position, his theory then of how he then wins the war goes something like this. I'm going to make an effort to try to launch giant offensives in the East or in Italy that will bring the war to an end that way. This is a recurrence of his Eastern schemes that he'd been trying for some time and that were always impractical and never had a real chance of fruition and were being opposed by the military. And would be opposed again, by the way, and defeated in early 1917. And then he'd be right back with Passchendaele and the rest. But in his head, he's also, and there's evidence for this, he's thinking, if my basically, if my military gambit to win the war under my great leadership doesn't pan out, I've still got my peace card in reserve that I already planted a year earlier with House to spin the Americans up. And then I will be the one who then brings peace. I'll manage that. And in any case, I'll be prime minister. I'll either be the prime minister who wins the war or failing that, for which I'll then blame people for not carrying out my grand plans, I'll be the prime minister who can then arrange the suitable peace. And in any case, I'll be at the center of the story. And already in January 1917, in confidential discussions, he's laying the groundwork to set up the potential peace move he already foresees he may need to make, either because his military plans don't pan out or because Britain goes bankrupt in the dollars to continue the war, which at that time was something that he and his advisors thought was likely. Well, there's no question that anybody who wants to understand how grand strategy, high politics and diplomacy really work needs to read this book, uh, not just because it gives us a glimpse of uh, another and perhaps significantly better world, but also maybe just as importantly, it gives us a terrific insight into how the sausage gets made, how exactly a strategy gets translated into reality and, and how sometimes in that process, uh, it gets turned 180 degrees around. Uh, the Road Less Traveled is, and I, uh, I freely admit I reviewed it, uh, an instant classic of diplomatic history, here I'm quoting myself. I think it's a must read for anybody interested not only in, in the history of World War I uh, and the history of American foreign policy, but uh, for anybody interested in the way that uh, diplomacy really works. Uh, it's been a real pleasure, Philip, uh, talking about this book. I think you're right 
uh, it is going to transform our understanding, not only in Britain, but elsewhere, of those crucial years, 1916 to 1917. And uh, it's a perfect illustration of how to apply an understanding of uh, the political process to the difficult, tricky business of historical scholarship. So Philip Zellico, congratulations on the book. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining the Hoover History Working Group. And I look forward with interest to seeing how far you change our minds about Lloyd George and about the First World War. Thanks so much. Thank you.